Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the second panel discussion at ET Auto EV Conclave 2022. Nut bolts managing the transition. This is a very pertinent subject looking at the dynamic situation prevailing in the supply chain space. To discuss this uh, uh, important subject, as you see uh, on the screen, we have a very illustrious and global industry leaders and experts who are going to discuss this subject. Let me introduce the panel that we have on the screen today. Uh, Mr. Dharmesh Arora, he is Chief Executive Officer, Asia Pacific Region at Schaeffler EAG. It's a, a Germany-based uh, multinational component manufacturing firm. We are also joined by Mr. Rajiv Chawa, Managing Director, MG Motor India. We also have Mr. N.K. Minda, uh, Chairman and Managing Director, Uno Minda Group. We are also joined by Mr. Sarwant Singh, who is Chief Executive Officer, Home Global Mobility and President and Chief Planning Officer at Switch Mobility. We are also joined by Mr. Rohit Sabu, our President and CEO of NBC Bearing. It's a CK Birla Group company and one of the leading automotive bearing manufacturer. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for joining ET Auto EV Conclave to discuss this important subject. Uh, so that's the panel today we have. I'm your moderator, Nabil A. Khan, editor ET Auto. As the topic suggests, uh, how are we going to manage the transition? Let me throw the first question to Mr. Minda. He, is also, he was uh, the past president of ACMA. So just want to understand auto component industry, which is about 57 a billion dollar industry when we talk about the peak uh, revenue. Just want to understand when electrification happens, uh, a lot of parts will go away, but whatever parts will be used will become a bit uh, costlier than earlier. It needs high precision. It needs to be light in weight. It should be uh, noise free or NVH uh, control uh, components will be required in such a scenario how do you see the Indian component industry will manage its value uh, when we uh, see the transition to electrification? So thank you, Nabil. Thank you very much. First of all, I think as we all know, the IC engine, you know, will continue. Why I say IC engine will continue? We, we welcome EV and we all know that EV will, you know, with the Pro, pro policies of the government, EVs is going to grow. But overall vehicle volumes will grow by 2030 as well. So to, today we, we, we are, let's say, uh, in 18, 19, which, which was our peak, 21 million, two-wheeler, four million cars, PV, and, and uh, electric, this CV and all. So overall volume are going to increase. We are estimating about 10 million PV. Of course, let's uh, these two years. Let's forget about the growth, but and similarly, you know, government with this uh, has announced forty percent in the car, eighty percent in the two wheeler. That's the desire. Huh? We are all working towards that. So I see engine. There is a disruption by EV coming, but who are all the manuf component manufacturers of I, I see engines will continue, and their volume will grow. Not to that extent. So they will definitely have a cake. Once uh, the, the two wheeler is expected to increase from 21 million to 40 million, uh, let's say by 2030. So, so this is my 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 you know intake on input. Crux on of the matter, Mindaji, you are saying that uh, the valuation will continue as you see that there will be incremental growth on the ice side. Uh, you accept that electrification will take place. That's how you are saying. Taking the discussion forward, Rajiv ji, just want to understand uh, you have rolled out a few electric products in car segment. Just want to understand how do you see Indian component industries capability to manage this transition? How much you think you will be able to localize going forward? Uh, so, you know, uh, me, thanks for that. Uh, and uh, now I'll echo what uh, Mr. Minda was saying that uh, uh, for the foreseeable future, future uh, ICE and EV will coexist. Um, and But EV growth is definitely going to be much more than ICE in terms of percentage, not volumes, but the percentage growth. Uh, and every year you can think of doubling it at least, if not more. Uh, uh, obviously, you are starting from a small base. 
so now, uh, you know, there will be various impacts on various people, including the component uh, manufacturers. Uh, so a lot of component manufacturers have raised their hands. They are actually uh, uh, getting some innovative solutions and parts. Uh, and, uh, and I would say that uh, because the government also has come out with this PLI scheme for even auto components. So uh, to my information, lots of uh, component manufacturers are interested uh, in, in getting into electrical components. It's a journey and initial period, in my opinion, four or five years are going to be gestation period. I don't have any doubt on capability of Indian <coughs> auto components manufacturers that they can really produce good quality at reasonably good price components in India. And not only for India, also for export, the way they have done for the ICE components. So it's a question of that this journey is starting now. You know, uh, volume is still less, but I am seeing a lot of hands, uh, you know, getting raised now. A lot of people getting into it. Uh, and because in India, we have started making this noise or we have started talking about it since last two years or so now. And it is becoming serious. So I think there's a huge opportunity. And I think our components player, in fact, I keep talking to ACMA guys, leadership and all. And in fact, we are supporting them. We have given them our EV cars to, you know, just to understand. And they have got an institute in Sonipat, IID, Sonipat, ACMA has got, you know, so we have given our cars to that institute. So I think a lot of work is going on and I'm quite confident they can do a good job. Thank you, Rajiv. I'll hear from you more on this. We'll like to hear some numbers uh, in terms of localization. But before that, let me go to uh, Dharmesh Ji and understand from him. Uh, you are currently looking after the APEC market where a part of the market has already transitioned uh, to EV. When we talk about the volume, uh, they have a reasonable volume now. India is going on that path. In this scenario, what would be your message? What are the area of your concern and how, what would be your message to your counterparts in India? Uh, how should they handle this transition? How can they ramp up their localization efforts when we transition to electric vehicles? Well, one thing uh, you know, which we all can agree is that the momentum and the pace of change has definitely quickened in the last two years, right? I mean, if I just look at our own view, which uh, you know would also co co uh, correlate with the, the view of the pan other panelists, two years ago, we were predicting on a global basis, maybe we call it 30, 30, 40 scenario, where 30% might be electric vehicles, 30% will be hybrid, and remaining 40% might be ICE by 2030. In two years, we have upped the ante to make it 40, 40, 20 which is 40% electric vehicles, 40% hybrids, and 20% ICE. Now, obviously, this is one number on a global basis, which cannot be applied to every country, every subregions, and so on, because the maturity level and the transition and the pace would be different, and also where they are coming from. So in the region now you talked about, uh, you know, when I look at uh, in the region here, Japan, I think you know, we can all uh, argue that they have been the leaders in hybrids for a long time, and hence maybe they are still you know, focused on uh, you know, on, on the hybridization as the path forward. But I've also seen, you know, very quick changes coming from their way on the electrification. And, you know, Korea has been on electric journey already. Coming to India and, you know, what does it mean to us? I mean, I can, I can, I can just talk about, you know, how are we approaching it? First of all, uh, you know, in the initial part, like Rajiv, you mentioned, maybe the business cases of this transition may not be very attractive. We know that. Right? I think there is a hump to be crossed over. The volumes will be small. The upfront costs, which you need to pay, investments into R&D, investments, the capex you need to pay for, uh, for bringing that in, all of that needs to be paid for. So the first volumes, the first business cases may not be very attractive, but then I think all of us have to make that journey. We have to put that in. And the benefits that the government extends or the help that the government help, uh, extends either on the supply side through the fame, uh, or, or rather the demand side through the fame, and on the supply side through PLI uh, would, would, would help. Let me just pause here. I, I can make some more comments in terms of you know, how we are looking at this journey and making this transition successful. Thank you, Dharmesh. I'll go to uh, Rohit Sabuji now. Uh, 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 Rohit Sabuji, you are one of the uh, crucial component makers when it comes to automotive space. You make bearings just want to understand, and for that matter, Dharmesh also is in that space. Just want to understand what kind of 
technical change you expect in the products and how are you going to uh, address the challenge that will come probably in terms of quality enhancement in terms of you need to reduce the sound you need to be lightweight and all kind of complexity is going to come with electric uh, vehicles or when we transition to electric vehicles how are you balancing the cost because uh, the volume is going to slowly increase right now it is not going to be a great volume so how will you deal with this so uh, thank you nabil uh, actually uh, for the uh, evs the bearing uh, requirement uh, is that it should be low noise low friction high rpm uh, with a material which will last long in under these conditions so uh, we have been uh, uh, into this research for about 5 uh, years now and we have developed and are supplying bearings to uh, many uh, ev manufacturers uh, in india and abroad uh, so uh, the the key thing is uh, that uh, the bearing can be developed uh, that is uh, not uh, an issue it is just that uh, we have to develop in in such a fashion that the life uh, uh, expectancy is equal or more than the ice uh, even with higher rpm and low tolerances uh, and the cost as you mentioned uh, this thing so right now uh, i can say that uh, we meet in every parameter except for the cost part the cost is slightly higher because of the inputs that are going into uh, manufacturing of these kind of bearings thank you rohit ji uh, uh sarvan ji i would like to bring you in here uh, you have a very rich experience you have been consulting automotive industry in your earlier uh, role you have helped a lot of big guys in the automobile sector now you are yourself uh, uh, leading a global uh, future mobility company or you can say electric mobility company i uh, just want to understand you understand indian auto component industries progress very well how do you see this you know uh, these companies helping or transitioning itself to be the supplier uh, for the global market also when we uh, look at the electrification because once local market progress to ev it will be much more uh, you know uh, you can say uh, better business case for them to export also to supply overseas also how do you see the preparedness and how, what would be your uh, word of caution to them how they should progress and a really good question so maybe let me use the example of my company to to build this as a case so we have come through um, as you rightly said we are a, a subsidiary of ashok leland we have put two different assets of ashok leland one which was in india which was making electric buses and then optair in the uk which was also making electric buses so what we did is we took the two businesses and put that into a new company and we call it switch and switch is like a accelerated startup which already has over 300 electric buses on the road now when we put the two organizations together what we found is we were using different uh, technology we were using different voltages in two different parts of the market we were sourcing components separately one for our uk vehicles and one for our indian vehicles and what we are doing now is moving to our gen 4 Uh, vehicles uh, and buses so it's interesting we are already on gen 4 and we are harmonizing the voltage we are harmonizing the technology so our objective is that all the vehicles that we make in europe so we are making buses in uk we are also opening a new factory in spain and of course we have india all these vehicles for example will be on a common electric vehicle architecture so we will move to a 650 volt architecture which means the you know of course there will be differences you know the comfort differences some of the uh, will be different but the overall architecture the base architecture of these vehicles is the same so what that means for example is in some cases like our battery technology you know we'll use standard nmc technology uh, some of the power electronics other architecture will be very standardized globally and that's an opportunity electric vehicles bring you know although there will be local differences you know overall it will be very similar so that allows the indian suppliers to build components both for the indian market but also for exports so that's to me is one of the key opportunities of course the opportunities are in uh, i think there are a number of opportunities in batteries and others but for me i believe one of the biggest opportunities in india is power electronic there is a huge shortage of power electronics taiwan is traditionally known as the big uh, country that was building some of these uh, inverters and going forward i believe that's something that the indian supplier industry can really pick up 
both for India but also for the global market. And again, I think I like to. Uh, I think we, when we talk about mobility in India, there's a lot of focus on two wheelers, and I totally agree. Two wheelers will go very quickly electric. Um, and yes, I agree that the cars, because of the infrastructure issue, is different. But when it comes to commercial mobility, I think we are not evaluating the opportunity there. India, for example, CSL today from the Department of Heavy Industries is putting together a mega tender. It might be the biggest tender for buses. Over 5,500 buses will be sourced. The fame to incentive scheme is really accelerating the development of uh, electric buses in India. Uh, and given especially the pollution problems and also the TC of these vehicles has a much more stronger business case than in passenger car market. So there's a huge opportunity to get into this market. I believe so. Anything I think that uh, your sourcing plan, where does India stand right now, and what's your plan for that? If you could briefly tell me, then I'll go to the next question. Yeah, you know, we are very much very keen on sourcing locally. Of course, we are part of the PLI scheme, so we want to source locally, we want to build locally, um, and we are very much looking at a localized supply chain. Uh, whenever we are talking to our suppliers, even if they're international suppliers, we're asking them to localize in India because we want to source in India. And of course, there's a huge incentive, both from a cost perspective, uh, but also, you know, it's much easier for us from a supply chain disruption, we see to source locally in India. Thank you, Sarvant. Rajiv ji, in your eyes uh, product, we have seen you have adopted very high level of localization. How do you see this uh, panning out for electric cars? Uh, yeah, any, so it, so, any target so that you have? Yeah, so definitely we have, uh, and as you know that we have also uh, applied for PLI schemes and uh, and we actually have qualified. Only thing is the formal uh, letter has to wait because of this FDI issue. Uh, so, so but we definitely are keen to go for that. And as per PLI scheme, fifty percent local ad you need to do local value ad you need to do in the vehicles, and we are targeting more than that. So we are targeting sixty percent. So in the next three years, we want to do sixty percent local value ad in India. So that's what our target is, which includes a lot of components, including battery assembly in India. Uh, and uh, uh, we will have two cars by end of next year, uh, EVs in our portfolio. One is ZS EV, and we have uh, done a facelift yesterday only and uh, relaunched it. Uh, and second EV, which we have announced we are launching next year, uh, which will be 10 to 15 lakhs of rupees of range. And uh, we are hopeful that we can sell 25% of our car as EVs next year itself. You know, so out of like our target is one lakh twenty total. Out of one lakh twenty, we should sell thirty thousand EVs next year itself, and we would have close to fifty-five percent to sixty percent local value add. So we are quite confident about That's that, and we are talking impressive, to impressive target, uh, Rajiv ji. Uh, can you tell me? You talked about sixty percent local content. Is it you are talking about in value term or the item term? Means uh, so. So as we are following the, I am following the terminology what government of India is using local value add. So local value add is sixty percent, which includes your local assembly and paint shop and stuff like that. So, but in terms of components, you reduce it by almost eight or nine percent. So sixty percent becomes fifty fifty one percent approximately for components. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, um, uh, Mindaji, I just want to understand from you, traditionally we have seen uh, uh, our weak points have been uh, the uh, electronics, automotive electronics, uh, uh, motor and controller. These are going to be very important with the electrification taking up as we transition there. How do you see the, what are the steps that the Indian auto component industry is taking or your company is taking to manage this? Because this is going to be a, a great value addition when, as uh, Rajiv ji also mentioned that uh, when we come to localization, these are very important component apart from cell manufacturing. Cell is another big ticket uh, component, but these are motor uh, controllers are very important and electronics. So how Indian manufacturers are working there? So thank you, Nabil. Thank you once again. And uh, as has been mentioned by Rajiv ji, you know, Dharmesh ji and my colleague Sarvan ji, that, you know, we all know in the AV is already in and all many, you know, there are many uh, new age OEMs have started production by importing components for this motor electronics from China. Even all these, you know, CV manufacturers as well as Rajiv ji, they're all importing from China or the other country. But the acceleration has taken place in the two-wheeler and three-wheeler segment. And we as Minda, 
as you know, we have signed a JV agreement with a company called Freevo and started engaging with all the OEMs, rather started supplying to few of the OEMs, our motor controller, which includes DC-DC converter, motor, charger, you know, the controllers and the hooters in order to reduce the noise of the EV and all that. So these are the parts and then some of the new innovation parts. So these are already accelerated in the localization and I feel within next two years, not only we, there'll be many component manufacturers will be engaged in two, three wheelers and will, you know, the localization will take place. Coming back to the- What sorry. will be the current market size uh, uh, when you talk about these components in India and how do you see it? As, of, as of now, as of now, the EV production of two wheeler, three wheeler is hardly two to 3% of the overall volume, but it is, it is increasing. It is increasing. No, I, I, I'm asking Amindaji, the motor and controllers and component like this, how much does it constitute to the total uh, revenue of the auto component industry? Uh, I would say that uh, other than the battery, these are the power electronics are the major consumers of the uh, electric vehicles, you know, the, the component names, what I told you. As far as the part of the auto component is industry, we are in the initial phase. If you compare auto component industry with 56 billion, we are too far. So it is in the initial phase. It will grow over a period of time. We all know that maybe 50, 60, 70% two-wheeler will be by 2030 will be EV. Coming back to the next question of yours about the PV uh, component and the CV, I'm very happy to hear Rajivji. I think the localization target of 60% I think I should immediately catch hold of him and, and engage as soon as pos possible based on our uh, competency of the two-wheeler. And Sharvanji also, he says, you know, the common, you know, the architecture, which is very good, you know, initiative they are taking, because once we do this standardization, so as the major said, the economic of scale, you know, when to invest, when to get return. So it will be expedited in the, in the, if this standard component can be there. So it is It is a chicken and egg story. When do we invest? But with the government, you know, initiative of PLI and semiconductors are going to be localized in the next th three to four years. With all those initiatives, I'm quite confident that we should be positive in localization of PV and CV component as well. Uh -huh. Power electronics I'm talking about. Thank you, Mindaji. Uh, Rohit ji, uh... Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, over a dozen states have come up with their uh, policies around EV that are this is both supply side and demand side. How much do you think uh, the industry can leverage that? How is it going to help? What are the key highlights that you see that will help uh, manage this transition? So uh, right now, uh, almost all the panel members have uh, expressed that uh, it is it is very, very initial stage. And uh, also because the uh, entire uh, battery battery electronics is imported as of now, uh, till Mindaji starts production, as of now um, uh, it is imported and therefore the cost of the vehicle, uh, whether it is two-wheeler or four-wheeler as compared to a I IC vehicle is uh, on the higher side. So uh, the states uh, and, and also the uh, central government has given some incentives which are very uh, minimal and uh, uh, do not impact uh, that much that uh, a, a normal person will be attracted towards the uh, electric vehicle. Most of the uh, people are buying electric vehicle because uh, uh, one, of course it is uh, efficient, Number two, there is too much noise uh, uh, around the uh, country and uh, people have a belief that maybe ice engine uh, would be banned or maybe something will happen or, uh, uh, you know, there are so many uh, stories that are going around uh, this thing and uh, the government is not doing anything uh, to quell these stories. So therefore, uh, the electric market, whatever sales they are doing, uh, they are doing. Um, uh, if you see the incentives uh, outside, uh, which essentially means uh, in, in maybe Nordic countries, in Sweden, <coughs> etc., they give up to 30% incentive, 25% incentive on the total uh, value of the vehicle. That really makes it attractive. 
so uh, uh, for us it is just a, a, a few thousand rupees here and there which will not make it very attractive uh, as of now so i say not adequate incentive that's uh, yeah that needs to be addressed by the state government dharmesh ji uh, how do you justify some people say that uh, uh, business cannot be driven by incentive what's your thought uh, because we we saw in china also when until the time this uh, you know incentive was there the volume was very high the moment incentive has started uh, uh, coming down the volume started uh, reducing so how do you see this you know built up based on uh, incentive well uh, a solid business case in my opinion cannot be built entirely upon incentives alone i think incentives are to get this going to get this initial hump overcome like i said earlier right at the end of the day there has to be an economic business case for you and me to buy an electric car or electric bus or electric two wheeler whatever right and and that's something i think we all are shooting towards and i think what the governments can do is to facilitate everyone to get there ultimately i think today if you were to argue i think two wheelers or three wheelers are almost there right i think there is a business case why anyone would already want to buy a two wheeler or three wheeler in a purely electric vehicle uh, uh, electric environment buses i think sarvant you mentioned i think the government is pushing very hard and and here we talk about city buses which is to great extent you know government funded i think it's the privately owned cars which is where i think we still have some gap i think you know we all have to admit there still is some gap in having a, a pure total cost of ownership through the life of uh, a vehicle ownership uh, somebody who drives let's say 10000 kilometers a year not some, i'm not talking about somebody who drives 300000 kilometers a year right for them i think there is still a gap in terms of of of, of uh, you know having that uh, parity with the internal combustion engine so in my opinion incentives today are necessary but whether incentive will forever drive electric vehicle absolutely no there has to be and there will be a pure business case of buying an electric vehicle thank you dharmesh ji uh, rajiv ji just want to understand from you the challenge part that you see when we talk about electrification or transitioning to electrification specific to passenger vehicles still the volumes are very less we are doing about 2000 2300 400 uh, units a month uh, against uh, over 300000s of ice engine and we have seen the ice engine degrowing but uh, uh, some give an argument that it is uh, also that people are moving to electrification that's why the ice engine volumes are going down uh, but electrification volumes are not going that up what are the challenges that you see in immediate term and there's another narrative that we saw that the battery cost was sliding which is not the case now we again see that the the cathode uh, you know chemistry cost is again uh, increasing uh, so how do you see this uh, you know impacting the transition going forward so you know um, uh... i'm a convert on ev okay so i'm i'm really biased uh, and uh, but but in that spirit uh, take my comments you know i see it in a totally different way two years back when we launched our zs ev at 22 23 lakhs of rupees uh, the guys were really making fun of us and the guys thought why the hell are you launching this car because the whole market the car market was 2000 cars a year uh, we got 2000 bookings in 15 days right now we are not able to supply but we are getting 700 bookings a month okay we are able to supply 2 300 uh, tata tata nexon and ultras they are selling 2000 a month by the way okay and i think they are also getting more orders than what they can supply so actually right now the market is around 3000 cars a month so it's not what you said so 3000 means 36000 uh, but you know because of chip shortages we won't be able to supply but this year should be around 30000 last year was maybe 15000 before that was 3 4000 next year i hope normalcy restores of chips and everything so i am looking at a market of at least 70 80000 passenger cars next year okay the biggest problem right now is we don't oem we oems are not able to give choice to consumers we have only two three products right and 
and the thing is so oems have not taken it seriously in my opinion they are not able to give choice number one number two charging infrastructure is a ever growing thing globally it's evolving india also is evolving and by the way 90 percent of our consumers in fact 95 percent of our consumers are charging the car at their home because we give a charger free with the car you know and they are do overnight charging for six seven hours a day and then we have other things like we are we as OEM field, we are responsible to create even that. So we have we have got fast charger with Fotom and and and, and Delta and Exicom. Uh, we are joining hands with some government agencies for super highway chargers. We just announced thousand chargers, you know, at residential complexes. So you know, I think if more OEMs join hand, I think it can be done at a faster pace. And the government is very clear. So you know, uh, I think there's a huge market for EV, and all the stars are getting aligned in that direction. The sustainability issue. Uh, you know, the global issues, COP26, government policy, total cost of ownership for our ZSEV car, it is less than one rupee a kilometer, whereas petrol and diesel now it's around three and a half to four rupees, you know, so, so lots of guys actually are converting from a small car to a ZSEV because of total cost of ownership. Most importantly, let's not forget the customer's choice. You know, two years back, Nabil, you and I have been doing this thing since last two, three years, and probably, uh, you know, we have been skeptical about the whole journey. Uh, but, you know, two years back, three years back, only five or six percent of consumers were looking at EV as an option. Right now, you take any survey, 40 percent of Indian consumers are looking for options in EV, and everybody's talking about it. So I think the biggest issue is choice, very less choice from OEMs. That's the biggest challenge, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I meant uh, the numbers are currently, I was talking about the monthly numbers, probably I got wrong there. About 2,500, 3,000 monthly number. Tata Motors is contributing 2,000 alone. Who had imagined that one OEM will do 2,000? We can do, we can do 1,200 a month right now, but we are able to get only three 400 allocation. So this, this year we will get an allocation How do you of 6,000. The constraint on the residual value of electric vehicle, that is also a big pushback for the customers. So How are you able to convince them? So, you know, there are three, four issues uh, as we have to go through this journey, we have to handle. One would be, and these are all separate topics, okay? I'm just dropping it yeah, now. Just drop. There will be a different, different uh, business case for dealers, by the way, for sales and after sales. After sales means their after sales revenue. How does it impact them when more and more EVs come into their portfolio? That's a separate topic altogether. Then let's talk about life cycle management of the battery. So, so uh, can there be a case for repurposing and reusage of batteries? Or can you do urban mining and take the extract? So we at MG are trying to do and join hands with our ecosystem partners to try each and everything, usage, do for repurposes for village electrification, towers electrification, and things like that. And also we are able to retrieve with the help of a partner 99% uh, of the minerals. We have done one battery of ZS, two batteries of ZSEV. So you know, then the financing of the battery, battery as a service option, that's a separate topic altogether. Coming back to your residual value. Let's look around globally what's happening. When you had first generation of EVs, residual value was an issue. But when you look at new Leaf, new Tesla, and new other products, you know their residual value is more than the ICE residual value. These are the facts. Okay, That's so when you're talking right. about a new generation EV like ZS EV and like what we are going to launch next year, these are contemporary latest global batteries, uh, global cars, you know, and battery life cycle is much more than the vehicle in general, it's 12 years, right? So, and when the battery gets financed separately, so that's no longer an issue in future, but yes, if you have an old uh, gen car, their residual value is pathetic in, uh, in my opinion, and that's what gets, that's what, okay. pe that's why people get biased. So Maybe just to add to that, uh, yeah. Nabil, Rajiv is spot on. When the first generation electric cars came, they had not a very good residual value. But if you look at the residual value of electric vehicles today, Tesla is over 60%, almost touching 70% after three years. Typically, residual values are 10 to be 40 to 60. Anything over 60 after three years is a big boon. And, um, you know, I've been driving a Tesla like uh, an electric car like Rajiv, and uh, I've never taken it to service. So that's the challenge, right? How do you ma maximize? And that's and another thing I saw in uh, Europe, which I'm sure will come to India, the OEM start controlling the second life. You know, Toyota ran a hybrid uh, reconditioning a plan where they bought the hybrids back, the Prius is back, reconditioned it, put a Toyota seal and put it back in the market. 
that increased the residual value and they, it increased uh, their market share in it. So I think all of these things is a matter of time before they start coming in. So, so do you do you think the battery uh, price rise that is expected that is happening now or will that be contained anytime soon or how do you see that? So if you ask me, Nabil, I think it's a short term. Have an impact on the cost or pricing of uh, electric vehicles going forward? I think in the short term, because of geopolitical issues, chip shortage, supply chain issues, I think there is a, and then now that the whole issue with Ukraine conflict, you know, this is all causing major issues in terms of supply and demand. Lead times have gone up tremendously. Um, so there is a big issue. But if you look at the amount of battery manufacturing and cell manufacturing capacity that is being put in, and also when you break it down in the, you know, in the past, it was mainly centered in, uh, in Asia, mainly in three countries, but going forward, India will build it. Europe is building mega capacity. Likewise, we are seeing huge capacity come in. So I think it's a matter of time. I mean, um, I, I, we see that prices currently are around 100 to 130 to $150. They will within the next two to three years start coming down below $100. So, you know, I think the path and now, I think the blessing with the Ukraine issue is, I shouldn't say that, but the oil prices have gone up. So that is pushing you even more towards electric. Uh, and in countries like India, where sensitivity is so high, you know, it will push that the consumer more to think about electrification. So, uh, 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 Dharmesh, what's your thought? Because yeah. I have seen that the, the, the battery chemistry price, uh, raw material price is also shooting now. I, I, I want to say that, uh, you know, that's a perfect segue that definitely the push towards the electrification will be even higher, right? As, uh, as uh, you know, geopolitically, you now countries try to reduce their dependence on oil even further. Um, now for, you know, uh, suppliers like us, you know, uh, who work with the OEMs like uh, Sarwant and Rajiv here on the, uh, on the panel, I think for us, it's important as to how do we make this transition quickly or quicker than we had ever planned. And for, for, for me, uh, you know, you asked earlier the question, you know, what can I advise or what can I, uh, you know, ask my fellow uh, supplier colleagues? Uh, I think that tremendous amount of technology, competence, capital, uh, uh, you know, required to make this transition and make this transition successfully. And for that, one thing that we need to do, first of all, is to make sure our current business is very, very robust, which means, you know, we have to put a lot more emphasis on operational excellence, make it super competitive so that it can generate the cash which is necessary for you to continue to invest uh, and quickly invest into this transition. So that's number one that I, I really look at uh, you know, from my own businesses and I can only advise all my colleagues that, that we do even better than we ever have done in the past. Now coming to the future supply chain, uh, you know, uh, yes, of course, you know, we have seen some recent uh, uh, you know, developments which puts even more challenges on uh, EV supply chain. You know, what is that? I mean, it's about rare earths, it's about magnets, it's about chips and the uh, you know, power electronic uh, components, uh, battery cells and so on. Most of it, which is not produced in India today at least, right? I think that's what we need to drive it. What does it mean now? How do we, how do we, how do we make this transition, right? How does it, uh, how does it uh, come into the region? The good part is this transition also means a tremendous big opportunity. Now, Nabil, you asked how big the market is. I remember, I think one of the studies said, by 2030, EV could be about $200 billion already, right? So that's a big market we are talking about. And there is a, definitely a big attraction to get there and get there quickly. Thank you, Dharmesh. Uh, Rohit ji, I just want to understand uh, the PLI scheme. Let's go back there. Uh, PLI scheme gives largely advantage to the big ones. A lot of small ones, Indian component industry largely, uh, you know, have a smaller uh, players. How do you see this? Uh, you know, uh, would you have expected something different in the PLI or how do you see that uh, the big ones handholding with the smaller ones to take long in this transition? Yeah, the, the PLI scheme uh, uh, is uh, a little complicated for the uh, small players to uh, take advantage of. Uh, uh, one because it is uh, it is capacity and uh, production based uh, over and above a certain uh, range and it is uh, industry based in the sense that what industry you are uh, uh, addressing to so uh, it is uh, very good for oems and for large uh, 
large auto component manufacturers uh, who are moving towards uh, EV, et cetera. The tier two, tier three manufacturers, I don't think will be able to take advantage of this and unless and until uh, they are uh, uh, handheld with, with the OEMs. So you are, uh, you are right in saying that I don't think they will be able to full, uh, fully take advantage of this. Okay. Mindaji, your uh, thought on this? Are, so, you, are you trying to build a bridge when okay. you can uh, take along your MSMEs and the smaller players to take advantage of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am totally in agreement with Rohit and to you also that, uh, the, you know, the OEMs and the large auto component, there are about 100 uh, applications uh, from the component side. So maybe government will approve maybe 30, 40. Uh, we are still in the process of the approval as far as the component manufacturing is concerned. But we all have to work in an ecosystem. Somewhere we get, somewhere the OEM will get and tier two, three, tier two, two, three, three in order to localize and cost effective solutions to the country, to the OEMs and thereby so that they can be competitive. They don't need to be import from China. China have economic of scale. The very purpose of this PLI scheme and the FAME 2 is to, as the major said, the initial stage of incentive and incentivization to, to promote all of us. And then so that we can make an ecosystem cost effective and OEM should pass it on the benefit to us and we to the tier two and tier three, as Rohitji said. Uh, Sarvanji, what's your thought on this? Um, I, I don't think I'm an expert to comment on it. Um, from an from a OEM perspective, I can say it's definitely very helpful. I think it's supportive. And I think like rightly, Mr. Mindaji said, the fact it allows the disadvantage that we have in India of not having scale, I think it very much supports that. And I think it so, focuses so us OEM, to localize. For As an OEM, how do you think uh, you can? help uh, these small players who constitute about 80% or even more of the entire component industry in India. That means if, uh, because there's a huge advantage in the PLI that will be taken up by only the biggies. Then again, this uh, large number of uh, uh, member of the industry will be left behind. So in such no, a scenario, so. how yeah, so I think the benefits will come top down is what I see it. You know, when the OEMs localize, they have to source local components. That's a key part of the scheme. So, you know, we will be looking to build and leverage our local supply chain. In particular, as you know, with Ashok Leland and Switch, one of the reasons we produce, uh, you know, so, such um, comparative products in India is because we localize and we have a very strong local supply chain. So, you know, our hope is as an OEM, that, that same local supply chain will also support us with electric components. Rajiv ji, what's your thought? Yeah, you know, you know, see, we need to understand uh, the, the overall perspective that localization in any case makes a lot of sense because in terms of imports, you now the rupee volatility, the freight volatility also uh, adds to a lot of uh, supply chain disruptions, right? So it makes a lot of sense to buy it locally. Uh, I agree with Sarvan, it has to come from top down, but let's understand it's not going to be easy even for OEMs to do because you need to do minimum 50% value add to, 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 get qualified, to get qualified for incentives under PLI scheme. You know, you may get the approval for, uh, from the government, but every year there will be an audit and you need to show that how you have localized and how much value you're adding before you start getting any money from the government. So it's not going to be easy. Having said that, um, I think I totally agree with Mr. Minda that it's a part of the ecosystem. You know, we have to uh, we have to all depend on each other. No one person can do the job. So when you are doing the work with tier one and tier one does with tier two to tier three, we need to hold hands. As Dharmesh said, you know, initial four or five years are going to be crucial. Good thing is the government is very clear that they want to promote localization. So they have made some schemes. Now they cannot do everything for everyone in one go. Right. So they have done for OEMs and tier ones let's to start with. Now we need to take care of tier two and tier three together and we need to get into this journey. I think that there is no time now to keep debating about is it good or is it bad? This is a this is a reality. OK, this is inevitable. This is going to happen. So let's support each other and get on to this journey. If I, okay, if let's, I add, maybe, 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 maybe
Sorry, Dharmesh, go ahead, please. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, the whole supply chain obviously is becoming very, very integrated. And during each one of these geopolitical disruptions, we have discovered that we are far more intertwined than we ever were. I think this whole e-mobility journey, I think there is more expected from the tier one suppliers like us to do for the OEMs. And you know we have limited resources just like the OEMs, right? So we need to then work with our tier twos that they need to pull up their capabilities. We need to give more of tasks to them. And they need to do the same for the next years and so on. So in my opinion, this journey, everyone gets to benefit because there is more expected at each tier level than we were doing in the past. Yeah, Mindazi. So just I was complimenting to Dharmesh ji and uh, Rajiv ji and Sarvan ji that, you know, perhaps one of the idea, let, let's say the OEM gets 10% incentive on the PLI. So they can give it to tier one, maybe 6%, 5%, and then tier one can get, give to tier two, maybe 4%, something. And year yeah. on year <clears throat> kind of reduction on the basic prices is one. This is, could be one of the idea so that the, the tier one, tier two, and tier three are all motivated and it becomes an ecosystem that look, depending upon the scale, economic of scale and depending upon the volume and then the localization speed, because there are the, going to be a huge investment as well, you know. <clears throat> so now we are running out of time. I'll just take one or two final question. One question to all of you. Uh, now we see that the COVID, which had a very long lasting impact, I think, I hope, I wish uh, that it is now about to go. And I think things will come back to uh, a normalcy and which is going to drive a lot of demand for the ICE as well as EV. In such a scenario, when the demand for the ICE engine or traditional vehicle also increases in such a scenario, how do you see what kind of the disruption or disturbance you think will be in the supply chain? How and what would be your advice? How to manage? What would it be? How will it be managed? You know, because the new B probably, which is electric vehicle, may not be left behind as the rush for uh, demand or rush of demand comes in place after COVID. I'll start with you, Rajiv ji. Yeah, you know. I mean, uh, you come from one problem, get into another problem. And somebody, I heard a comment from somewhere that, and I like that, you know, when COVID happened, we said uh, we are into a new normal situation. Now, one of these uh, eminent personalities said, actually, it's nothing called new normal. It's never normal. So we are in a world of never normal because from COVID, hopefully we're getting out, as you said, but we are getting into another geopolitical tension, right? And we don't know, none of us knows how will it pan out and, and what's the impact, short term, long term, you know, it depends on how long does it go. So, and then we know the issues about the metal prices going up, you know, freight is unbelievable. One container of $600 pre-COVID is now $8,000 post-COVID, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, and the metal prices, we know the inflation, inflationary issue, we know. So we don't know whether it's going to be a huge growth or it's going to be stagflation or, or recession in most part of the world. We don't know, you know, uh, and then the government, uh, central government policies. So the whole thing is we cannot control that. We don't know. So I think every organization, uh, including us and everyone has to be very, very agile, flexible, very efficient, go back goes back to what dharmesh was saying whatever we are doing we need to make sure it's very efficient very productive less waste and that's why it's very common sense go back to the basics because we don't know what will happen next day um, so yeah, yeah your thought 30 seconds sarvanti your thought sorry i was on mute yeah so nabil one very interesting you know you mentioned uh, in my previous life uh, so i remember doing some modeling and we looked at <laughs> what is the peak of the auto industry after a recession? And it was always three to four years. You know, the auto industry is very resilient. It rebounds very strongly. So, you know, one thing I can say, whenever these geopolitical issues get resolved, there will be a rebound. The second thing I think, <coughs> when I look at the auto, Indian auto industry, let me just take the example of buses. India sells 40,000 buses a year. Um, compared to China, which sells 130,000 buses a year. Now, if you look at the infrastructure in India and China, Indian infrastructure is terrible compared to China infrastructure, but we still sell so many low number of buses. Now, urbanization rates in India are going up. <clears throat> so first thing that makes me always think is, when will India become China? Maybe it won't sell 133,000 units a year, but can India sell 80,000 units a year? And I think same for the passenger cars, India is selling four, four million. 
when will India sell six, eight, 10 million vehicles? So I think what I see is over the next 10 years, you know, with the Indian GDP, the way it's growing, even if it grows at 6%, India will become the largest economy. That means Indian auto sales will grow and will start reaching those levels which we needed to see. And that means there is a big demand coming. So when I talk to component suppliers, I think we are talking about the big shift to electric, but there's also going to be a big shift to demand. And where we are sometimes conservative in India is not making that dynamic decision of putting more capacity in. And I think that's something I would recommend the Indian component manufacturers to seriously think that somewhere down the line in the next 10 years, you know, that, that peak will come and that peak will continue. And you need to start looking at building capacity in the country. Thank you. Yeah, Mindazi, your thought. So I am in agreement with Rajivji mainly that, you know, we have many, many challenges as we know about starting from semiconductor. It is not only the semiconductor shortage, it is, I would say that kind of a, you know, rationing or maybe hand, I mean, stretching your, twisting your arms sometime by the distributor or the manufacturer. It's not really a, really a, really a shortage. And the commodity price increases, and this, you know, with this Ukraine effect, we we know we don't know where are we ad adding adding. So at this particular moment of time, my point would be my suggestion would be that we have to look at the daily work management. We have to watch the situation daily. Maybe some defer some, you know, initiative special initiative which we are taking by one quarter. Look at your fixed cost should not increase because. Not only the challenge of semiconductor and commodity increase and containers, attrition is also one of the major, you know, <laughs> I don't know, we have been seeing that the global attrition is increasing also in India. So with that, so quarter on quarter watch, month on one watch, and the key word Rajivji said, agility. Agility and speedy action, you know, speedy decision making, whatever we can do, but not uh, you know, considering not only considering the short term, you have to keep mid term and long term in mind, as Sarvanji said. Yeah, uh, Rohit ji, uh, what's your thought? Especially, do you think uh, the shortage of semiconductor is already there? Do you think further the shortage of other component will also come into play? See, if you, uh, Nabil, if you see the uh, history of the, uh, especially the Indian auto component industry. Indian component industry, as uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Rajiv and Mr. Sarvand was saying, uh, uh, that capacity should be added in advance. And Indian auto industry has always uh, envisaged the, uh, the uh, good times or the high uh, production and uh, invested in time. So, uh, and this is a cyclical uh, industry and we all know that. And right now, uh, uh, if you, if you, um, see the uh, a slightly longer uh, time frame, not the immediate time frame, because a lot of things are happening right now. If you see a slightly longer time frame, we are in for fairly good times. We have uh, uh, been uh, in uh, in uh, a little down in the last two years. We are in for fairly good times, and most of the Indian component industry has uh, has invested for the future. Number two is uh, whether it will affect uh, whether your initial question was whether the increase in demand of ice will affect the uh, supply of components to uh, EV. EV. Uh, yeah, but if you see uh, the uh, the main components of the EV are independent of the ice, so they will be very different. They will be, have different capacities for the EVs. So uh, uh, yes, of course, there are a few things which are common, uh, for example, like our bearings, uh, the lines are common, the bearings are different, but the lines are common. So it may or may not impact. But um, uh, Mindaji can answer this better. But uh, uh, I think uh, in the history of uh, uh, Indian auto industry, um, we have never failed our OEMs. Okay. Shri, your thought. Uh, well, I think uh, everything has been said so well. Uh, I mean, I can again say what we are doing. Uh, you know, yes, we are looking at our flexibility, how you know our plants can respond quicker to the changes which are happening, how we can be more agile. Uh, you know, again, the resilience piece. You know, where are the parts coming from? What happens? 
Um, and, and that's where the scenario planning comes in. We work with scenarios now. We don't have one plan. We have one plan, we have second plan, we have a third plan, all of them available at once. And you, you, you hopefully can just pull that out. So scenario planning has become extremely important. And last piece, uh, you know, I don't think this is the time to slow down on your investments. You know, at least that's my advice. We are not slowing down. I think the st India story is very much intact. The demand very much is there. And, uh, you know, this is not the time to slow down. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. That was a lovely discussion. What comes out that uh, uh, there could be a, a problem as the industry had put a pause on the investment or capacity expansion if the demand roars back the industry needs to be agile and they need to see that how do they manage it uh, in a shorter time thank you so much once again for joining et auto panel discussion on nut bolts managing the transition to electrification thank you so much once again